Hello and welcome to Let's Talk, a series of podcasts produced by the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation on the issues that matter to us and the issues that we know matter to you as well. Substance use disorders, prevention, research, treatment, and recovery support. I'm your host, William Moyers, joining you today from the Betty Ford Center here in Rancho Mirage, California. My guest is none other than uh, Vice President of the West Region, Chris Yadrin. Chris, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. And our topic today is on methamphetamine. You were telling me before we started that it's known as crystal meth, ice. What else do we call it? Tina, crank, chalk. There's a whole number of names. Um, The fact is crystal meth is becoming more and more of a problem once again. Why? Uh, for a number of reasons. I think drug t- trends shift for a, a variety of reasons, whether it's perception of harm, access, cost. One of the things that we've seen, if we look historically, is oftentimes after there's been an, uh, an epidemic of opiate use, mm-hmm. it's been followed by um, a big problem with stimulants. We saw it in the 70s with heroin and then cocaine in the 80s. Um, And of course, now we have a huge opioid problem in this country. But over the last several years, crystal meth has once again become a huge problem for us. What is methamphetamine exactly? Uh, Methamphetamine, it's a a powerful stimulant. It's uh, similar, it's related to um, amphetamines. Uh, The the presence of methyl makes it methamphetamine. Hmm. Um, uh, Methamphetamine is typically a powder that people will snort. Um, crystal meth is a crystallized uh, version of the drug that people will smoke, and it's very intense, it's very powerful, um, and the capture rate is very high for people to become addicted. What do you mean by the capture rate? What I mean by that is if uh, someone were to try tobacco versus heroin versus marijuana, um, from that first use to the point of developing a substance use disorder, how many individuals become addicted? Um, And it's very high for crystal meth Mm -hmm. because it's such a powerful stimulant. There's a misnomer, or there was at least at one point a belief that methamphetamine addiction could not be treated. Why was there that perception out there, and is that in fact true? I don't think that's true at all. I I think one of the limitations that we face are providing the appropriate medication-assisted therapies that we have for some other drugs of choice that are making a real difference, for example, with the opioid epidemic at this point. Um, So that's a limitation, but um, I do think crystal meth uh, addiction is very treatable. Here at the Betty Ford Center, at the Hazel Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation, we use a variety of evidence-based treatments, whether it's 12-step facilitation or other evidence-based psychosocial supports Mm -hmm. and treatments to intervene um, upon individuals struggling with this particular use disorder. One of the things that makes crystal meth so challenging is just um, uh, the way it acts so powerfully on the body and on the spirit. Mm. Um, But then another thing that's true about crystal meth is um, it also increases um, one's uh, libido. And so a person's sexuality and sexual behavior oftentimes gets wrapped up into the use um, of this drug. And then that makes it very difficult and very challenging to heal as well. Interesting. Um, So you mean, for example, when they tell us to stay away from people, places, and things, you can't stay away from sexual activity because that's natural to the human experience. Exactly, right? Our sexuality is wrapped up with who we are. Um, So the people, places, and things becomes even more powerful or even more challenging for people to avoid. Are there certain populations that are more vulnerable to the use of methamphetamine and thus addiction? Well, around the turn of the millennium, we saw a dramatic increase of crystal uh, meth use, um, especially in the LGBT community. Um, it often hit rural uh, parts of rural America very hard. Um, and the, it got the government's attention. And by 2005, there was some legislation passed which made it very difficult to buy the supplies needed to produce crystal, crystal yes. meth in the United States. And we saw a decline. And then around 2008, it started to go back up again. And I don't think it's limited to just one community. It, um, I saw an article recently by our medical director from our Plymouth facility that treats um, our youth continuum and young adults. And Dr. Joe Lee there yes. was talking about how it, he sees an increase in it in terms of a younger, uh, increased use of the drug among our younger population. Um, 
I was looking at the stats just this morning, and from 2008 to 2017, um, uh, crystal meth use has actually increased eightfold wow, in that period of time. That. So it's continued to go up. Last year, or I should say in the year 2017, 10,000 people, 10,000 of the overdoses um, in term, that led to deaths were from uh, amphetamine use, and crystal meth a big part of that. What about among the patient population that we treat? Can you give me an approximate percentage of the number of patients who have a methamphetamine dependence? I don't have the hard numbers today, uh -huh. but I've been speaking with some of our site directors and anecdotally, they are seeing an increase as well. I was speaking with Matt Polichek earlier. He's the director of our site in West Los yes. Angeles, and uh, he's seen a dramatic increase over the last year or two in patients presenting with um, uh, a, a, a substance use disorder primarily focused on crystal meth use. What should families look for if they sense or have a perception that their loved one might be struggling with methamphetamine? How does that manifest itself in the user? Mm -hmm. Well, like any drugs, um, any, any substance use disorders, you'll see behavioral changes. You'll see changes in their physical appearance or in their mood and the stability of their mood. With crystal meth, it's pretty powerful and pretty significant. So you'll see insomnia, you'll see mood swings, intense anxiety, intense depression at times. Um, but also uniquely characteristic of crystal meth is you may see some psychotic features or delusional behavior. And psychosis is just a way of speaking about a person's break or disconnect from reality. And that can happen in a variety of ways. It might even be as simple as tactile hallucinations where they feel their skin yes. um, is crawling, crawling. and itching. Mm -hmm. And so they'll itch their skin and you'll see sores on their skin. Crystal meth use is also characterized by very, um, your, your appetite is diminished. It's sort of a binge and crash pattern. Mm -hmm. So people practice very poor um, diet, nutritional habits, hygiene habits, and you'll see in their teeth yes. a lot of decay or, or the loss of their teeth. And so between the skin sores and some of the changes in terms of their teeth, um, those are some physical markers that you might notice if someone is um, uh, further along the path in terms of use of crystal meth. And yet when a patient um, who is dependent on methamphetamine or crystal meth uh, comes to treatment, they don't get isolated or put in a special unit. There's always a misnomer, right, that people have to go into a segregated unit. That's not true. Right. I mean, there's no special unit. We're still treating people, right. um, human beings who are suffering from substance use disorders. and. Um, like any drug uh, of choice, it ends up leading people to a life of alienation, isolation, disconnection from themselves, mm -hmm. from others, from their higher power. Um, so we're just trying to connect and create a safe and stable place for people to, first of all, heal physically and get right. back on track in terms of their diet and their sleep. Um, people might be up for days using crystal meth and they will, um, because of the way there's an initial rush and then a high that lasts approximately 12 hours, mm -hmm. people will cycle through again and again without resting, without sleeping. So it's real important to just get physical rest and nutrition at the beginning of their treatment. Mm -hmm. And then as they become more stable, they along with other patients can begin to work on some of the psychosocial and spiritual components of the disease um, as anyone else would in treatment. As I said earlier, this often does get wrapped up with a person's sexuality. They also struggle because the way because of the way crystal meth works. It releases so much dopamine in such a powerful way. People have a hard time experiencing pleasure once again um, uh, for some time. It takes a long period of sobriety and abstinence for people to get what they need. So ongoing recovery management and support and developing a support system in a recovery community are really um, important and vitally important for people struggling with crystal meth addiction. But recovery from it is possible. Absolutely. Um, as a counselor myself, over the years, I've treated numerous people who have recovered and recovered well. Here at the Betty Ford Center um, and our other sites, we see people who are able to engage long-term recovery from crystal meth addiction. I know that with the legalization of marijuana proliferating now across the country, there has been talk that one alternative form of, quote, treatment for methamphetamine addicts is marijuana, that, that mm -hmm. perhaps the application of, the use of marijuana might be better for a methamphetamine addict than methamphetamine would be. What, what's mm -hmm. your take on that, Chris? 
Um, my take is, first of all, legal doesn't always equal safe, right? right. So um, alcohol is legal, nicotine is legal, and yet we know there are serious health ramifications. Um, people at this point who wish to use cannabis or marijuana um, as a silver bullet or a panacea for mm -hmm. a whole variety of ills, I think the truth is we don't really have the research or the evidence to suggest that that's the case or that that would be even helpful. And there's a, a tremendous number of health risks associated with cannabis use. So why replace one ill for another? I think that what we offer here at the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation in terms of comprehensive recovery for the mind, the body, the spirit is an important way to approach um, this from an abstinence-based perspective. Not in a narrow-minded or mm -hmm. dogmatic way, but this works. It's been proven to work for, for uh, thousands uh, of people over the generations. So um, I, we want to continue to, to treat this um, to treat this substance use disorder effectively. And your point, as we get ready to close here, is that uh, treatment for methamphetamine addiction is not only viable, but that recovery from methamphetamine addiction is a reality for many, many people. It's just taking that first step and admitting you have a problem and finding the appropriate level of care. Absolutely. Um, being able to reach out and ask for help is crucial as that first step. And once an individual does that, um, he or she can begin to heal um, in terms of their body, as I said before, get the rest that they need, get back on the path to proper nutrition. Um, but most importantly, begin to build new relationships and healthy, sober relationships that feed and serve the human spirit in terms of lasting recovery. So definitely, hope and healing are very possible. Chris Yadrin, thank you very much for taking the time to bring your experience and your strength, your professional uh, passion and your personal passion to the issue today of methamphetamine addiction and methamphetamine recovery. Chris Yadrin, thank you very much. And thanks to our listeners and our viewers today for joining us for another edition of Let's Talk, a series of podcasts on the issues that really matter. On behalf of our executive producer, Lisa Stangle, and our Blue Moon Productions crew, I'm William Moyers. We'll see you again.